Vedas are not a religious text. They are a practical how to do text. But the Rig Veda is actually uh, extraordinarily bloody minded in terms of its practicality and its absolutism in terms of national interest. Duty of the king, says Rig Veda, is to destroy the enemy. And I'm quoting it now. By fair means or foul, if you have the interest of your kingdom in mind, of your state in mind, then you should put, you know, put aside these concerns of morality, of being right, doing good. It's far better to bring down an enemy by kuta yuddha, covert warfare, than to actually march army, armies and move armaments and he says that's very costly. The subject matter is of considerable interest because um, usually what you see by way of Bishkek summit and international relations in the public eye uh, is really not how nations actually interact, how they influence each other, how they try to pressure each other, how they um, get their way or don't. So uh, this is all as much a matter of, should be a matter of public concern uh, because what happens is um, generally foreign policy is seen as something that the government of the day declaims and you have the Ministry of External Affairs and the Ministry of Defense and various ministries trying to further the aims and objectives of government. Uh, but that is the, shall we say, the overt aspect of policy. What is on the surface, what is not known, what is usually not talked about is the subsurface, below ground. The sort of thing wherein you know about the secret channel of dialogue that Ambassador uh, Satish Lamba carried on for many years during the Manmohan Singh era, uh, and he talked to his uh, special representative, the NSA on the you know, on the Pakistan side, um, and they almost reached a solution. And if you believe the Pakistanis, Manmohan Singh backed out a solution for Kashmir, a permanent solution. Uh, and uh, I believe that's correct. Uh, Manmohan Singh got cold feet when the uh, solution was negotiated because he felt precisely because there was the BJP on the uh, right wing who were going to, they, I mean, that's what he apprehended. Uh, they would criticize him for any kind of a deal with Pakistan. So he got cold feet and drew back. It's a wonderful permanent solution. That is what Imran Khan is referring to when he says we can have a solution, a negotiated solution, because the solution is already there. It's already there. So the point to make is that so much of interstate affairs happens covertly, not overt, covertly. So we'll try and contextualize it a bit. Um, ever since uh, I mean, in the history of mankind, this is very, this has been a very normal occurrence. There's nothing new. All states and major countries try and influence and try to get their way to whatever means. Um, there are two most ancient civilizations are, of course, India and China. Uh, if we date our civilizations to some written or some known artifacts like the Vedas in the Indian civilizational case. Uh, nobody has been able to date the Vedas. We don't know actually. You can date the Chinese uh, you know, strategic fount of wisdom as Sun Tzu, who was say around 523 BC. You can date it because the Chinese have a written culture. They write down everything. They invented paper. So you actually, if you go to Beijing and the archives, they have records of 2000 years back. Actually, they, they, they have epigram, epigrammatic episodes of government. What we have for the first time we had it, uh, you know, on paper was Kautilya's Arthashastra. That came exactly 200 years after Sun Tzu. Now, the statecraft of Arthashastra is not, people don't understand that Kautilya did not write it. 
he was not the original author of Arthashastra. He was merely a compiler. It's a codicil. It's a compilation of received wisdom that was passed on before uh, Chanakya or Kautilya by word of mouth. He merely put it down on paper. It's a very good thing. Otherwise, we wouldn't have had the record that we have of Arthashastra. But if you go back to the Vedas, it is remarkable what the Vedas are not. Vedas are not a religious text. They are a practical how to do text. I mean, the Vedas um, are fairly bloody minded actually. If you read the, the most important Veda, the Rig Veda, and I, I don't uh, read Sanskrit unfortunately, and like uh, most modern day Indians, we don't, I don't read Sanskrit. My father did. So he could read Sanskrit, he could understand, possibly had he read the Rig Veda in the original, he would have got far more insights. Had he been so attuned as I am to security and these matters, he would have had better insights than I've been able to uh, generate from English commentaries on the Rig Veda. So my take on the Vedas is second hand. It's not original. So I should put that on record because there might be some of you who actually can read Sanskrit, in which case I would urge you to get to uh, the original Rig Veda and read it and perhaps write so that many of us can gain from your insights. But the Rig Veda is actually uh, extraordinarily bloody minded in terms of its practicality and its absolutism in terms of national interest. In those days, the Rig Veda was kind of, again, uh, advice to the king, what the ruler can and cannot do, should or should not do, and how he should do it. So, in the Rig Veda, when I say bloody minded, this is kind of language there is from the English translations of it. The duty of the ruler, the duty of the king, says Rig Veda, is to destroy the enemy. And I'm quoting it now, by fair means or foul and if you go down there after the Rig Veda, the, the, the interpretation, the, like Sukraniti, the great Sukra who wrote the Sukra, Sukraniti in the 6th, 7th century, talked about how it's far better to bring down an enemy by Kuta Yuddha, covert warfare, than to actually march army, armies and move armaments and he says that's very costly. It costs not just in human life but in national resources. It costs a lot of money. If you can get the same objective and goal realized by using other means, covert means, spies, assassinations, poisonings, and these are all quoted by the way, in great detail. And the point that Rig Veda makes is, there is no morality. When the interest of the ruler, in those days ruler, but interest of the state, there is no morality. It's amoral. All actions are amoral. You cannot be moral about it. In fact, in fact, the Rig Veda says, and I'm paraphrasing this, the Rig, Rig Veda says that morality should not come into what it says is doing things correctly, th doing things right and morally should not be the concern of rulers. That may be their personal desires and their personal inclination. But says the Rig Veda, if you have the interest of your kingdom in mind, of your state in mind, then you should push, you know, put aside these concerns of morality, of being right, doing good. Because to further your interest, to advance your state's interest, you have to use covert means, other means, all these other means. That it then goes on and lists, and it's quite extraordinary. So and there's a bit of this in the Arthashastra. If you look at uh, the statecraft that uh, uh, Kautilya or Chanakya has compiled, he talks about precisely the use. I mean, and, and this is a very big thing. And, and there's 
when you read many of these commentaries, as I did, you discover how contemporaneous it sounds. The use of what in the present parlance between spies are called the honeypot, using pretty girls or pretty women to get to subvert the state. I mean, this may be a very sexist thing, but unfortunately, this is part of spy craft, covert craft, state craft. So there have been, there are all these uses. Uh, Rig Veda also lists a whole bunch of poisons you can use <laughs> to actually do away with your opponents. Now you may say, how does this comport with Hinduism? As we know, it was supposed to be immoral, uh, that and the other. As I said, Hinduism has nothing to do with it. Hinduism, you know, is a later construct, the religious aspect. We are not a religion, as far as I know, Hinduism is not a religion of the book. There is no one book. There is no book. If there is a book and there is a Rig Veda, then it is a completely <laughs> amoral treatise on how to wield power, how to advance your own power, how to get more of it. It's not to be abstemious and go into one vase and you know, give up life, nothing of the kind. It's extremely materially oriented thinking. This is unique. This is original. If you want to call it Hinduism, fine. But this is Hinduism. Unless you say Rig Veda doesn't matter. In which case, nothing else matters. Because much of our Vedic tradition ought to have derived or supposedly derives from the, these Vedas. There is a remarkable parallel between the Chinese cultures, Sun Tzu's writing and our Vedic injunctions for rulers. What is the basic Chinese notion encapsulated in, in an aphorism by Sun Tzu? Sun Tzu says, and I'm quoting now, quote, be subtle, be subtle, twice. This is the subtlety being the important part of the Chinese statecraft. Be subtle, be subtle, and use your spies for all kinds of business. That's the basic injunction, all the other strategies that then he writes about, which the various kingdoms, from warring kingdoms on down, the Qing dynasty, everybody used. By the way, when the Chinese and President Xi talks about recovering for China, the acme of its achievement. Do you know what age that was? That's the Tang Dynasty, 423 BC. Incidentally, when China, as the Chinese see it, the Chinese see it, was at its zenith. 423 BC. They see it as China being the masters of the world, they survey. So when they say they want to go back to recovering that China, that's the kind of historical tradition they can hark back to. We have nothing of the kind. Because as I said, we are an oral culture. We learn things by rote, which is helpful in our little kids in America getting winning spelling bees and stuff like that. But it doesn't help. The statecraft, because our statecraft over the years has, for whatever reasons, gotten straight jacketed into a morality straight jacket, into a kind of what I have said in my books, I call bovine pacifism, cow. The pacifism of a cow. Now, my point is, that Nehru understood to a very great extent, he did not like the bloody mindedness of all this, but he understood the use of morality to get his ways. So in the 50s, if you look up, he used the, the you know, the uh, cudgel that you know, moral actions gave India to raise India's stock in the world. And so somehow we got tagged with morality. Ah, India is a great pacifist notion, this, that, and the other. 
in that sense, perhaps we succeeded too well. And we got imprisoned and have since become victimized by our public professions of morality, or what the nations can or cannot do. That is the concept of responsible state, which we are now stuck with, that burdens our international relations. We want to be a responsible state. While no other state is responsible in the sense that they're giving up on their options, we are the only ones. Don't do this, don't do that, because we are a responsible state. So the Chinese are very happy, as are the Americans and the British and everybody else, with India being a responsible state. Because we do nothing. We are hampered by our own sense or historical notion of morality, which is not there. It's entirely bogus, by the way. Entirely bogus. It's certainly not there in the Vedas. They, it recommends entirely contrary kind of policies and measures by the state to advance its, its, its interests. Just to set the context again, I mean, when you talk about the modern notions of court warfare, before we get to the subcontinent of India's record, which is the first, I mean, and, and, and court warfare means everything that you can think of. To a great extent, it's psyops, psychological operations. How to influence the adversary population to work against the ruler or the state. The first uh, instance of PSYOPs, recorded instance of PSYOPs, was the use by the Persians against the Egyptians in the Battle of Pelusium in 1523 BC, wherein they used cats. Why cats against the Egyptians? Because for Egyptians, uh, cats were like cows to present-day Indians, I don't know. They're holy. If you go to Egypt, you go into the Tutankhamun treasures, look into the prehistoric, the pharaonic Egypt. Cats are the medium of afterlife. They communicate. So the Persians use cats to defeat the Egyptians by letting a, you know, a whole bunch of cats out on the battlefield and that completely unnerved the Egyptians and they lost the battle. The classic case of psychological operations, in a sense, defeating the enemy. Let's come into the more modern age. Genghis Khan, by the way, incidentally, Genghis Khan and his golden horde is supposed um, to have been so prolific in their uh, <laughs> procreation activities and generally sweeping across Europe that, uh, and they, they are the last known kind of influence that came in a wave that was irresistible, swept across the steppes of Asia, right across Europe. What was the psyops Genghis Khan used? Something, by the way, that Emperor Ashoka used, and then, of course, got subverted by the lesson, whatever it was that he learned from it, but I'll, I'll get to it in a slight, uh, slightly later. Genghis Khan used that. He would first go and completely destroy and decimate whole villages. Let a few people escape, so that they would go to interior villages and towns and say, oh, Genghis Khan is coming and he spares no one, not child, not man, nor woman. You know, you had to be frightened to death. So there'll be a whole bunch of people completely fearful of death at the hands of the Chinggis horde, who would run away and create panic and hysteria down the line. So as Chinggis Khan and his army and horde advanced, there was no opposition. Because psychologically he had disarmed them. They were unable to put up a defense. Because they were so psychologically, you know, psychologically unhinged, so fearful of what would happen to them. Because of the example that he set by burning and killing one village, but using the, the, in a sense, the ripple effect, psychological ripple effect of that event 
to disarm nations in his path. Much of Europe actually fell to Genghis Khan without much fighting. People don't understand that. Because he was so good at it. And he cultivated this image of a merciless, a ruthless killer who would just, if there was resistance, he would just bloodily destroy it. And his reputation therefore preceded his armies coming into Europe, sweeping across Central Asia, sweeping across Europe. That is the kind of extraordinary thing. This was, by the way, 13th century, 12th and 13th century. The greatest mass movement of occupation forces was Genghis Khan's Golden Horde. How did they do it? By psychologically disarming the adversaries, making them incapable of putting up resistance. So that is the power of covert warfare, Kuti Yuddha, the power of playing on an adversary's mind, power of not actually confronting or fighting him, but playing on his mind so that he doesn't want to fight you anymore. He just lay down the arms or just run away or surrender or sign some peace deal with the on, on rushing horde. In the modern era, PSYOPs have now the medium of technology. Starting in the First World War, <clears throat> you have heard of MI5 in Britain, there was MI6, and then what many, very few people know about is something called MI7B in the First World War that merely generated pamphlets that were airdropped over you know, simple open biplanes over German trenches to play on the mind of the Germans in Second World War, which got reduced to trench warfare, everybody digging uh, ditches and being behind them. And that had a great effect on the German, demoralizing the German forces. So you come to the Second World War. Now the medium is getting finessed. People are getting to understand what psyops can be and how they can be used. You had the master information propagandist, uh, you know, technician in Joseph Goebbels who built up the Third Reich in Germany, built up Hitler and the Third Reich into, an, again, an irresistible force that would win for Germany its old, you know, its old influence areas like in Czechoslovakia, but also win for Germany new breathing space, Lebensraum the breeding space for a nation, for a vigorous nation to grow. The notion of a Lebensraum is that the Germanic notion is, and it was spelled out by Haushofer, was that very vigorous nations need territory to expand, resources of those territories to grow, to become prosperous. And if it's not available by peaceful means or by stealth, then by force. That's the notion of Lebensraum. That's why when everybody is confused, why did Hitler so want the Soviet territories? It's because they were so sparsely habited. There were no people. As in Central Europe, where it's a, and by that reckoning, it's a fairly relatively densely populated area, not by Indian standards or subcontinental standards, but densely populated by European standards, where once you cross the Volga and into the virgin lands of the Ukraine and so on, you have land, no people. Perfect space for Lebensraum. Haushofer's notion. That's why Hitler, against all historical thing, Napoleon's record, every record that you do not fight the Russians with oncoming winter, he, he, he still went on. And of course, the rest is history. Post Cold War, the same thing. What happens? You have the, Russia, the Russians now turning the tables and 
uh, with the ideology, the Marxist-Leninist ideology, motivating a whole bunch of people in Cambridge, the great Cambridge Five. Burgess McLean, Ken Cross, Anthony Blount, Anthony Blunt, and uh, who was the five? Have I named all the five? Yeah. These guys, I'm sorry, Guy Burgess, yes. Guy Burgess, uh, Donald McLean, uh, John Canecross, Anthony Blunt, and one more. Anyway. That's four. There's one more. Anyway, uh, so Kim Philby, the great Kim Philby. How did I forget Kim Philby? Yeah, his uh, pseudonym was Stoney, by the way. In the acronym, as a spy, the Russians called him Stoney. That's his epic, you know, epigram uh, name. Anyway, so these are the stuff. I mean, the Cambridge Five were so successful in diverting the most secret documents to the Russians that there was no secrets that the Russians didn't have. And this is in the 50s. Who put them on, I mean, who, who really gave the British the inkling that, look, there's a spy in your midst, a whole bunch of spies in your midst. It was a Russian defector in 1961, Golitsyn, who told the British MI5, MI6, look, we are getting everything from you. Anyway, that's when all these people decamped, ran back, ran out to Russia. The Russians uh, uh, exfiltrated them back to Moscow safely, etc. The Americans, being usually very crude, had their own assassination program called the Phoenix Program in Vietnam. It's called Phoenix Program. It was an assassination of Viet Cong leaders. Uh, political leaders who were above ground, who were not uh, actual guerrilla fighters. And you had, that began the, and, and by the way, the Second World War um, MI7B counterpart was Churchill's political executive, operations executive, political operations executive, POE, doing the same kinds of things. It would make all fraudulent war plans or orders of battle. What is an order of battle? Just uh, I'm sure you all know. Order of battle is uh, what are all the armies actually, which units are on what front. That's an order of battle. So the British would f leak these kinds of completely fraudulent thing. They'd have it fall into the hands somehow of some Germans. And the German plans, oh wow, we've got great secret material. It's all planned by the POE in London. Beautifully done. Whole bunch of things that they did very successfully. What has India's record been? Considering the context that we are traditionally have it in our culture, in our Vedas. We should have been, you know, we should have been masters at it. Arguably. We should have been very good at this sort of thing. Because the Chinese are very good at this sort of thing. They use it all the time. Look how beautifully, and as I said, court warfare is everything to demoralize, to limit the adversary's options. Anything you can think of is court warfare that's not above ground, that's not openly conflictual, is court. See how beautifully the Pakistanis nuclear missile armed Pakistan. Right? How beautifully we did that. It contained India. And we fell for it. One of my great... I mean, the themes I've been writing about uh, and repeatedly in my books and so on and trying to point this out and iterating this theme is how the Chinese have got us to think of Pakistan as a very difficult enemy that we have to fight all the time. In other words, the Chinese have got us, got us to reduce ourselves to Pakistan's size. Have they not? Given our fixation? Yes. Just 
And it doesn't have to be just this government. All is Pakistan. Because the people get excited. Oh, Pakistan, you know, there's a match tomorrow. Oh, Pakistan, India, there, that. I mean, it is such a ridiculous thing. It's almost tragic and painful for me anyway to see this diminution of India to the state. I've always written that a country is known by the enemies it keeps. If you think Pakistan is your big enemy, you are reduced to Pakistan's size. That's why when I go to Pakistan, they're very happy. They're, they're, you know, they walk around like, uh, you know, cock of the walks. Because they know they have reduced India to their size. We just obsess about Pakistan, for God's sake, when we ought to be obsessing and being worried about China. It's just right there, and we are not worried about China. We go to Bishkek and, you know, our Prime Minister jump up and down and start um, being nice to, and then you won't talk to the Pakistanis. No, I will not talk. I mean, this is how our diplomacy has got down to where success or failure is judged by whether or not and how we act publicly towards Pakistani counterparts. Isn't it? This is so sad. This is so sad. That's why India, is, India really doesn't count for much. That's why my last book, Why India is Not a Great Power, and in brackets yet, because I'm still hopeful that maybe uh, we'll lose some of these uh, foolish constraints we have put on ourselves psychological, political, military, because we deal with the Pakistan instead of dealing with China and then uh, becoming great power. But court war warfare, now our problem is this, our court warfare is vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan is pretty good. What do, I, what do I mean by that? Again, you shouldn't get too excited about it. Because of the same culture, it's very easy for any Indian, I go into Pakistan, I'm a Pakistani. With my beard, I'm absolutely Pakistani. In fact, I remember, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of this, I had gone into Sarajevo in 1982, and I met the Grand Mufti of Sarajevo. Sarajevo is the easternmost, the westernmost outpost of Islam in Europe. That is the point where Saladin established when he was on the gates of Vienna, he had approached the gates of Vienna, he drew back and consolidated his presence in Sarajevo, the great, great grand mosque, the blue mosque at Sarajevo. And I wanted to see that when the 82, just when the first inklings of Balkan Islamic sentiments were rising. And I, the Grand Mufti of Sarajevo, just assumed I was an Indian Muslim. And I did not disabuse him of that notion. So he said to me, I was there just around noontime, and Azan sounded from the great mosque. He said, shall we go for the, the namaz? I said, sure. Why was I so sure? Well, I went to a military school here. And in our military school, all the religions were equally treated and on all religious occasions you would have uh, religious leaders from uh, that particular religion coming out and uh, giving some speeches and stuff like that. And we saw what our friends who were Muslims were doing by way of the, you know, calisthenic exercises as we saw it. Now we didn't. We understood, I mean, we, we, we saw our friends repeating the first uh, line of the Quran and so on when they do the namaz, you know, invoking Allah and so on. And sure enough, <laughs> I didn't budge at all. I went there with the first line in the very honored to be in the first line. And I shouted the first line and did all the stuff and they were completely satisfied. The point to make is this is syncretic culture. Islam in India is a completely Indianized version of Islam. It's not Wahhabi Islam. It's not the Saudi Islam. And if you go to Pakistan, I mean, I've been there many times, to the elite marriages, 
there's not a bit of a difference. I'm married to a Delhi Punjabi girl, not a girl anymore, but as they say, the girl in the Indian sense. You can be 60 and call be a, still be called a girl. So, the same Riti Rivaj on the other side, exactly the same, mainly the same, dual dal, and the same everything, the same damn thing, right? No difference, except instead of going around fire, they have the, the Rita Kalma and uh, the, the Quran is there and they sign a contract. The, it's easy for both sides to penetrate each other. That's the point I'm making. Because there is no difference. Oh sure, if you, if you pass off, you go into Pakistan, into Saraiki region of Punjab, and you can't speak Saraiki, then you have a problem, you're caught out. That dialectual, you know, dialect changes in regions, like here. So if we spend, send the right kind of people across, who know exactly the dialect of that particular area, there's no way. Similarly, for them to, so we are interpenetrated. It is said by intelligence agents, uh, or, or so it is said, that a cabinet decision made in India is known to Islamabad GHQ Rahul Pindi in one hour. Within an hour's time, the most secret decisions of the Indian cabinet gets known in GHQ Rahul Pindi. The advantage we have is that we, un we get to know what the GHQ Rahul Pindi is deciding within half an hour. So we still have a half hour margin. That's a joke. But not really. We actually have the drop. But this is the kind of covert warfare where we excel at. Pakistan is a we have penetrated it well, uh, we have all kinds of assets there and so on. And they too have assets here. In fact, when I met General Hamid Gul, the great Hamid Gul, who is a great villain here, uh, you know, Hamid Gul, Hamid Gul, you know. So when I met him in Osnabad, uh, some uh, 2003 or thereabouts, I was, it's good to know that he used to read my stuff. So he wanted to talk to me and, and, and he asked a mutual friend of ours to arrange a party, dinner party. And I've not met a general, I keep saying that to my military audiences here. I've not met a general staff officer from either army who was so intellectually on the ball. I think I can argue pretty well on my feet. I can marshal my facts and figures quite well. But I discovered that so could Hamid Gul. I didn't, I was not prepared for that. I thought most generals are, well, you know, not particularly bright, etc. Mis, misapprehension, obviously. Hamid Gul was on the ball. He said to me, and I say this to the, when I, whenever I go to Pakistan, come back, I'm debriefed by the special branch raw and all that stuff because they want whatever little extra information they can get from anybody they can get it from. But Hamid Gul said to me, Ki, we can't compete. We are no match for India. I'm paraphrasing it from the dinner party. He said, we are not match for India. But he says, we too have sleeper cells here on your side. Sleeper cells are uh, that lie low, uh, that are activated, like the Cambridge Five, that the Russians activated 10 and 20 years after they were recruited by Russian agents at Cambridge. Similarly, they lie low, they marry Indian women, they settle down, and suddenly one day they get the, the switches turned on, and they activate it, and they are told to do this, that, or the other. He says, he said to me, and he knew that I would say, tell, it to our, our intelligence and counterintelligence, we have 600 sleeper cells in India. Exaggeration. Well, that's what he told me. So I obediently came and said that, I know it's not true, but this is what he said, Hamid Gul. But the more important thing he said was this. He says, we use our covert warfare 
as our cutting edge because we know we cannot fight you in a straight fight. If it becomes Samukha Yuddha in Vedic terms, Samukha Yuddha means total war. We can't handle it. We are finished. We can fight Kutu Yuddha, he didn't say that, what he meant it, using asymmetric means to unnerve, unhinge, unsettle the Indian policy establishment. And he says where we have the edge is that Pakistani state, and he meant by that the Pakistan army, because they are the state in Pakistan. Whatever Imran Khan may say or Nawaz Sharif may have believed. He says, we can hold our nerve in a crisis. We can hold our nerve in a crisis. What he meant was that you can't hold your nerve in, your, in the crisis. Because we know you go off like headless chickens. When something goes wrong, everybody is running helter skelter, we can't manage anything. Look what happened uh, with the uh, Air India uh, hijack from Kathmandu that was landed in Amritsar and yet was allowed to fly out of Amritsar even when a very simple expedient of putting a truck in front of a plane would have stopped all that. Punjab commando, police commando were there, everything was there, they still didn't do it. Lots of nerve. We just go, our brains go helter skelter. We don't know what we are doing. We're running about. Oh, hey. Feel of chaos and confusion. That's what Hamid Gul meant. That's where Pakistan military thinks it has the edge. It can keep its cool, it can keep its nerve in a crisis. It's very important in covert warfare to keep your nerve. Because whether this Mr. Jadhav, who was ex-Navy retired, is a spy or not, who knows? We don't know. But we have very good intelligence. What the Pakistanis are frightened of is precisely that we'll be able to know where their hideouts for the nuclear weapons are. For them, it's a security safety valve, is the ultimate thing that ensures their, you know, their security. All this to point out that there's, while there's every good reason for Pakistanis to feel afraid and to act afraid and to build up and be paranoid about India, there's absolutely no reason for India to do the same vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan. There's absolutely no reason. Given that we are, we are, any, we are so interpenetrated, we know their stuff, everything. But what is our thing against China? Our main threat? Near zero. Why? Because the Chinese do their, I mean, Chinese language is a problem. The basic Mandarin alphabet, there are 3,600 pictograms. 3,600 not 26 alphabets, 3600. I have been with Ambassador C. Viranganathan when we went for a 1.5 track to China, the first 1.5 track during the Vajpayee years. And C. Viranganathan was a classical Chinese scholar, one of the very few the foreign services produced who could better the Chinese in Chinese. And he was therefore greatly feared by the Chinese in the sense that he could outspeak the Chinese in their own language. Why? Because the original Chinese, Mandarin is a synthetic language created by the state in recent times, by recent time in the late Qing dynasty, you know, turn of the last century, from the siècle. It's not Chinese language, which, by the way, has 26,000 pictograms, which for, for the common and popular consumption was reduced to 3,600 pictograms. 
So 26,000, I mean, you just, knowing 26,000 should have had to have a almost computer-like memory to recall. It's not just knowing something, but to recall it and instantly vocalize it. That's the sort of thing Sivir Ranganathan did. And I, I used to, I asked the ambassador, my God, the Chinese used to, you know, I remember the first plenary session and the Chinese were goggle-eyed because he was speaking such fluent Chinese and they, I could see that they didn't understand what he was saying. It was very highfalutin, you know, stuff. And he completely bamboozled the Chinese. Beautiful unnerving of Chinese. I've never seen Chinese unnerved. And they just, Talking to each other, you know, I mean, you can literally see, oh, oh, you know, they can understand smidgens, right, of what he's saying. We cannot make out, because it sounds Chinese, uh, but we don't know what he's saying. We are such high classical Chinese. And he would allude to 8th century poet something or the other, and he'll pull out something else from somewhere in Chinese history and so on. It's a marvelous performance. And I'm sitting there looking at the Chinese, and the Chinese are looking at each other and they're just shaking their heads and we can see how beautifully he had completely unsettled them. That is the essence of covert warfare, Kuti Yudha. That can, you can unsettle an enemy by any means at your command. But do we have such language experts around? No. He was a unique guy. He was a unique guy. And therefore, our language, Chinese language category of experts is very small. If you have a small category of Chinese language experts, you cannot read Chinese documents. You therefore cannot understand the Chinese policies very well. You therefore have to refer to Western Sinologists who interpret it for their own ends, not yours. Because interpreting China, Chinese also, as I said, unless you are completely aware of what's being said, the nuances, there are so many inflections and nuances in the Chinese language, just the tonal change will give you a very different meaning, completely contra in a contrary meaning, tonal, it's not even the pictogram, the way something is pronounced, and I can't, you know, I was given an example, I can't remember, but just to those of us who just hear Chinese, it's all garb, you know, it's all gibberish anyway. But that tonal difference can communicate a nuance, an inflection, a meaning that others can't get. And therefore, they're always at an advantage. That is why when the Chinese insist that when they speak to the opposite numbers in negotiating, they always speak in Chinese and they try to be even more obtuse in the Chinese by using more pictogram, you know, that kind of language, which can, uh, our translators then have to struggle with, Are, kya kaha is ne? you know, what, what do you write down by way of minute, the note taker. And therefore, there's a the beautiful story that uh, Ambassador V.V. Paranjape uh, refers to in his memoirs, wherein he says, I was translating for the first meeting between Nehru and Zhu Enlai, the great Zhu Enlai, perhaps one of the greatest Asian uh, statesmen ever, and an extraordinary and a negotiator par excellence. He was telling, he, he was talking to Nand, I mean, in 53, the exchange was offered, as you perhaps are aware, uh, Arunachal Pradesh and the entire uh, Chinese claims on the McMahon line for. India acceding to the Aksai Chin. They said, let's just exchange it and we are friends. Nehru said, no, 53. It was again offered in 55 and he went to Beijing. Again, he said, no. It was offered as late as 1984 to Rajiv Gandhi by Deng Xiaoping. Again, he said, no. Anyway, that's besides the point. But the point to make is the Chinese are completely and absolutely aware of Chinese, of Indian shortfalls. Because we are so anglicized, at least the elite, and I'm sorry to say I am part of it to the extent that I'm elite at all, is that we love to show off our English, do we not? To Westerners. 
We do. The Chinese, even if they understand the English very well, will not show off. Will they, they'll just keep quiet and wait for you to trip up and not give you an inkling as to what they are thinking. And that's certainly true at the official level. So that's where someone like CV would come in, who'd unhinge them in their own language. It's very important. Language is very important in, diplomat, in diplomacy. What, how have Chinese, Chinese of course, used Pakistan? As I've said, nuclear armed them, giving them weapons for the militaries at friendship prices. They are the main prop right now for the Pakistani state. There's nobody else. That is IMF, but IMF invariably extracts all kinds of very harsh conditions. But Chinese give it away in the hope they'll recoup it all by getting Gwadar, getting this, getting that. The point to make is, and this is what I admire about the Chinese immensely, they always work on a long view, long plan. Very long view, long plan. Indian policy doesn't seem, we can't seem to see beyond our noses. That's true of all democracies. Just, I, I, it's not that I'm trying to berate India. That's true of America, even worse. I remember head of a uh, state, US State Department policy planning telling me, Bharat, you can point out all the mistakes we make and you're all absolutely right in my books. I keep doing that, uh, you know, and why America should not be trusted as a strategic partner or anything else, is that he said we have a, just a five-year window, which is the presidential window, whether he gets elected or not. We have a five-year window. He said that's all we do. We think of five years. That's it. We have a similar kind of constraint. And this is a problem for all democracies, that we unlike autocracies and authoritarian regimes, totalitarian regimes like China, who can plan very long, very distantly, and then work towards achieving the, those objectives that they set themselves as a nation, and then mobilizing and marshalling the resources they have on a national scale to achieve the results they want. Um, we have no such advantage. But what advantage we have, we don't use. Uh, before I get to the Chinese, the advantages we have that we don't use, uh, which are my favorite themes. Um, let me get into the uh, PSYOPs part vis-a-vis -vis the Pakistanis. I mean, these are things you discover when you interact with, I mean, they were part of us and so on and so forth. We should have known all this, but we did not. The first time we got an inkling of how to, in a sense, uh, blunt the Pakistani armor, armored advances. We learned by sheer happenstance in the 65 war. When we discovered our lead armor going into across Ichogil Canal, we discovered that as soon as Indian tanks hove into view and trained their guns on the Pakistani tanks and fired the first shell, usually it's a rounding shell, meaning you are trying to get it and you are trying to get the range. These days it's all automatic, but in those days there were no automatic range finders and so on. You would have a, a shot and the second shot was the one to kill. At the first shot, you'd find Pakistanis jumping out of the tanks and running away. You know why? That's right. That they would be fried in the second shot, kill, kill shot. And as Muslims, you don't want to uh, you know, have your die in fire. That's an old Islamic, whatever it is, prejudice. Well, what does it do to its armored forces? You can train all you want, but if at the first instance you're going to jump out of the tank and run away, all the armor is no use, right? Indian army discovered that. And thereafter used it in PSYOPs, they go on the uh, battlefield frequency and say, Acha, bhi aapko, you know, um, aap, uh, <laughs> whatever it was, that we are going to fly you and send you to, to Jahannam, you know. Uh, you be prepared for it and all. And all this sort of thing worked 
it was on the alpha link which is on the battlefield frequency you catch on to the pakistani frequency and they all on and they say oh abhi abhi aapko theek kar denge you know abhi jahannam jaoge you know aap kafir you'll die a kafir when you're burned your body is burned you die you, you die as a non believer so you work on their minds so the tank driver and they're sitting inside they're listening to all this indian chatter communications chatter and they're saying oh abhi aane wala hai bas tumhe to khatam ho jayega yani tum kafir baro ye kafir ho ke you know it the tank crews were actually abandoning their tanks jain harbak singh the great uh, western army commander 65 he told me that he said the first time we discovered these guys just running out and then we said god why didn't you use our brain we should done it before that's right we know these goddamn Punj- punjabi muslims i'm using harbakhsh's terms by the way so i'm i'm a punjabi sikh they're punjabi muslim i understand them entirely it's a cultural thing we should have known this we but we got to know it only after these sorts of incidents were reported by our advancing arm and that's why so many patterns were and shafi tanks were captured in 65 war do you know how many were captured in excess of 75 tanks 75 tanks what percent of their entire 30% of them shot up 25% came completely ready we could have used it and we did by the way incidentally so patton tanks that were the most modern the americans saying what the heck are you guys doing so this is psyops psyops you're working on the minds of the people handling the weapon it is completely bogus if you sit down and say rationally say well there's nothing to it but if you play on the religious a culturalization factor when you're saying oh, you're going to die a kafir oh that's the worst thing that can happen to me that's the end of it you can't fight you're disabled you're psychologically disabled so these are the kinds of tricks the indian army has learned over time but the larger aspects of covert warfare i'm afraid we are not very good at we are not for instance very good at we do it we do it what are the cultural i again with pakistan it's easy because the cultural icons are all bollywood actually i mean tune on tune into any pakistani radio or tv or whatever and and you will all you will find a bollywood songs and nach gana and stuff like that they entirely tuned to the bollywood culture and they entirely take the cues from whatever you think is indian culture there's no such thing but it's all there we say with china there's no commonality that's why it's a much more difficult task to deal with the chinese and we have given up thrown up our hands if the task is difficult and you're unwilling then to do what is necessary to attain the capabilities that you must to deal with the chinese and you don't do it what is it safe for you that you've given up the game you don't want to be in the game you can't match them nahi in se never pakistan se ladte rahenge china is too much for us to handle we give up at first oh they are 10 times our eco- economic size they are so big so that i been to china if you go in from shanghai 90 kilometers in it's like india but do we do our do their media show it oh, now i'm not allowed into china by the way but that's a separate thing but they thought they could convert me and they invited me to spend uh, they said please come for 6 months to the shanghai institutes of international studies i said no nope. 6 weeks okay so i was there for 6 weeks phenomenal infrastructure i've been not just shanghai then i've been to uh, to uh, dailen to kunming and all these places i mean they build for day after tomorrow we build for yesterday no oh, absolutely true the infrastructure you you motor down and they took me purposely to see the infrastructure from kunming to dailen and so on i mean eight lane highway and no traffic eight lanes 
no traffic. So I asked them, but how, how do you make it economically viable? There's no traffic, no nothing. We are sort of cruising in a straight road, absolutely barren of any habitation. The occasional car would zip by on the other side of the divider. And the official said, yeah, we're investing in it for tomorrow. I said, you mean day after tomorrow? He said, yes, day after tomorrow. And look at us. We planned for yesterday. That's the difference. The long view. What did I say about the long view? Very long view. But the other long view when they deal with India is, of course, they have used now Pakistan beautifully. But what's happened to us is, China is one problem. We have pretty much, as I said, we have very little what we should have done. I'll just very quickly think what we should have done from the very beginning, and we haven't, is to cultivate Taiwan. Taiwan has an embassy here, which is called the Trade Council or something like that. The ambassador is called a trade representative or something. These guys have been imploring us to formally recognize Taiwan as a sovereign state. Why don't we do that? Why? Because, but the Chinese insist that every time our PM goes to Beijing or on a state visit or in Bishkek or he meets with Xi, they all insist invariably that we all recognize and formally accept one China. Is that right? They say one China, two systems. One China, three systems, or one China. And I've been pleading for 20, 25 years now. Why don't we also say you recognize one India, which is all of POK, the entire Kashmir, or will not recognize one China? Fair is fair. We don't do that. I've been when on the, I was in the NSAB, the Foreign Secretary came before us at the National Security Advisory Board. And I asked K. Raghunath, he was the Foreign Secretary, 1998. How have you responded to the Chinese nuclear missile arming Pakistan? Have you done anything? He looked morose and shook his head. I said, have you considered not nuclear missile arming all the states on China's periphery? Of course, this sends shivers through the American ranks, non-proliferation lobbies in Washington and elsewhere. When I say this, and I say it to them, in all my books, I've said it. They get frightened. But what about non-proliferation? I said, screw non-proliferation. Does the Chinese think about non-proliferation when the nuclear missile armed Pakistan? Is not, what's his name? A.Q. Khan. Or Mubarak Mand, the physicist. Is the Chinese giving them wholesale designs, expertise, material, and say, here, Meccano set. You know what Meccano is? Meccano is, at least when we were growing up, little sets wherein you looked at, uh, they'll give you everything, and you just have to screwdriver together, and you'll make a, a, a truck or something. That doesn't make me an engineer. Have the Pakistanis learned anything about nuclear? Sure, they are bright. But did they invent, I mean, did they, was the uh, weapons that they started out with, were they Pakistani? No, they're Chinese entirely. So I said, why didn't we do a tit for tat, which is what the Chinese understand. It doesn't need any language skills. If you do this, we'll do exactly that to you. They would have understood had we done that. You know what K. Raghunath, the foreign secretary, tells me in response? He says, Mr. Karna, that's not practicable. Practicable? That's what I mean. All the notions of correctitude, propriety. In affairs of state, there's nothing proper, improper that a state can do. There's nothing immoral that a state can do. There is no morality. But yet our foreign secretaries, our government secretaries, are infected and animated by these ideas that end up constraining our own options, limiting our own options. Taiwan, for instance, it is on an accelerated pace. We have a program not known, is there in my book, the last one. And everyone was upset that I disclosed it. I said, Well, if you don't disclose it, how will the Chinese know? Of course, the Chinese know. But the point is, 
but who reads books so it's a reasonable thing you see that they'll train our military MI military intelligence in Chinese language they have a very good lab in Taipei so we have many of our we are building up our Chinese military intelligence cadre courtesy Taiwanese that's a very good thing the Taiwanese say we will invest fully into India remove do you know when you talk about FDI into China, 80% of FDI is Ch Taiwanese. We don't know that, do we? Taiwanese are saying, I've had the trade representative, the ambassador here, say, tell me, we are prepared fully to relocate to India, all our investments. Can you imagine this? The yearly FDI, Ch Taiwanese FDI into China is $80 billion, 880. All they say is, let us fly our flag, call us an embassy, which we are not willing to do. Why would they then willingly give you the things you want? They are also the prime mappers of the Chinese cyber grid, the Taiwanese. They said, we'll give it to you, because they know we can't, we don't have it. Our NTRO and all these things, the less said about it, the better. Our cyber warfare capability, again, if not zero, is minus zero. There is minus zero, you know, minus figures. You know that, do you not? In mathematics, there are negative numbers. We are into that territory, very bad. Our cyber warfare is very bad. The Taiwanese are saying, we'll give you the grid to penetrate the Chinese most secret of the Chinese installations, the second artillery forces, which is the nuclear force. Again, they're saying we'll do all this and they're given, they're given you samples, let's put it that way. A tasting menu, when you go to a restaurant, some highfalutin restaurant, you get a tasting menu. You eat a little bit of that little and you love it. They, they're given us a tasting menu. But we don't have the guts and the will and the vision and the gumption ultimately to take this option of recognizing you know, Taiwan. And therefore the Taiwan is saying, fine, whenever you come to your senses and you, we will then think about it. We are not going to give it to you free for nothing. Why Israelis coming in? For 30 years we treated, 40 years we treated them like pariahs. I remember meeting the, the uh, Israeli ambassador in, uh, used to live in a pokey little building uh, in, in Mumbai. At that time, Bombay station was a hazard station for the Israeli Foreign Service. It's now one of the prime stations and we are increasingly cooperating with Israel. Why? Because we diplomatically recognized them, formally. Before that, as the Prime Ministers, Israeli Prime Ministers always loved to say, you treat us like mistresses, not wives. You want to keep us hidden. You don't want to bring us out, our relationship. Exactly the same analog for Taiwan, which could be the Trojan horse as far as the Chinese are concerned, because we can't handle China. We have no idea of how to handle China. Taiwanese do. It's like India and Pakistan. They, it's the same culture. They know it. They have all the familiarity. They have all the access. They have divided communities just like here, who are also our prime intelligence assets, by the way. All the Mohajas who went there are our prime intelligence assets. No more prime than Altaf Hussain, by the way, who led MQM and who in Delhi said partition was a mistake. So this, we don't have it. Our Vedas say it all, Kuti Yuddha, Kuti Yuddha, Kuti Yuddha, I mean, we are the last best practitioners of Kuti Yuddha, we don't practice it at all. Other than, as I said, in this petty sort of way with Pakistan. Where is the Kuti Yuddha and that perspective and mindset vis-a-vis -vis our prime enemy, China? We don't have the cap you know, capacity, the capabilities, the manpower. But where, when very last, very, very quickly, we very easily succumb to um, foreign influences, in this case, the Western influences. I am US educated. All my friends 
some of them you may even have heard of. My batchmate at UCLA was Ross, Dennis Ross, who was the plenipotentiary Middle East for three presidents. He was my batchmate at the UCLA. And so they're good friends of mine. What do the Ameri what have the Americans done? ever since we decided from Narasimha Rao's day and certainly now in the last in this new millennium to in a sense influence the mind of the elites to do their bidding to further the American policy aims and objectives and goals why is that not a good thing because then our geopolitics does not converge with that of the United States, they are on the other side of the globe. They have different sets of interests. They, it does not in any way comport to ours. They do not converge. And yet we think and act as if they are our Langotia ours and you know, great friends and so on. They are not. I went to, to, you know, to California in America when I was 17. I'm now 70. And I grew up with people who went into the US government, who are very good friends of mine. And they are the ones who are saying they do this normally. How normal is this? You've just seen and heard that Kim Jong-un's half-brother was a CIA agent. You saw that? This is how they serve at the highest levels. Here in India, for instance, they don't have to do anything that drastic. All you have to dangle is a green card. I'm sorry, but that's the truth. The greatest temptation for Indian middle class, middle class Indians, a green card. A few years back, a Home Secretary of great rectitude, he had a spotless record, which can't be said for most secretaries of the government of India. He was unique in having a spotless record. We used to meet occasionally in his North Block office. And on one, in one such meeting, he opened the drawer and said, this is a, you know, he gave me a paper. It had a list of names. All the names were secretaries of the government of India. I said, what is this? He said, these are people who in some way or the other have been suborned or subverted by the United States government. Their children are in America. Their families are there. They have immigrant visas, H1B visas, or uh, you know, green card is the most obvious thing. Many of these guys schol get scholarships for their apparently Einstein-like genius children. And they do their bidding. They, you know, it's nice. Now you have Carnegie and Brookings in Delhi. They are the leading edge of influence, American influence in this country. And they're deciding your options. I know Ashley Tillis very well, very well. He's the one man who, when he comes in from Washington, can get an instantaneous meeting with the Prime Minister. Do you know that? The only person in India or the world, he can tomorrow say, I'm coming and flying into Delhi. Modi has, PMO will say, okay, when are you free to come in to meet the Prime Minister? This is not a joke. This is a fact. This is the, the extent of how we are willing to be influenced by, because we think it is in our interest, when it may not be. This is how court warfare is used against us by friendly countries. The Central Intelligence Agency's biggest operations, do you know where against what, which country? UK. Oh yeah, you're right. UK. By the way, the Langota Yas, their most intimate ally. The biggest counterintelligence ops by the Central Intelligence Agency in its history was against UK. James Angleton, 
the great counterintelligence chief of the central intelligence. The point to make is that old adage, you keep your enemies close, your friends closer. I'll end on this note. Um, Oh yeah, but I, I mentioned that. You missile arm the states on China's periphery, you deal with Taiwan to get the cyber grid. You, uh, for instance, I've said that, um, you know, how this helps. And these are things now American think tanks are picking up. I mean, my idea of arming uh, states on China's periphery, for instance, was recently picked up by some American people, you know, they say, oh, this is such a great idea. Because against an unscrupulous enemy, you cannot afford to have scruples. But we act, we all act as if we are in some never, never land. You see, where everybody is very moral. Everybody gives you, uh, you know, ask your permission, you know, before beating you up. No, Vietnam is a, one of the great, I finally went to Vietnam a few months back. One people I absolutely most admire. Extraordinary people. Unlike Indians, we are a beaten down people, I'm sorry to say, when you look at the history of the Vietnamese. So thousand years. You go into Vietnam and there's a museum there and I, I urge you all not to go to America and Europe on your holiday, go to Vietnam. They have a museum there a military museum for the imperial war, against, imperial fight against the imperialist Americans or something like that. And they have shot down all the B-52s, F-86 Sabres, they're all there in the museum. And they record the history. How hard it was for them. How they prevailed. Not just against the Americans, against the French at Dien Bien Phu, against the Chinese in 1979, they beat the heck out of the Chinese until the Chinese cried mama and you know declared victory and got the hell out. That's the best way when you're losing is to declare victory and run out. Okay. Well, that's what the Chinese did. And you know who beat the Chinese PLA, the 8th Army PLA? It was irregular forces, not even the main Vietnam Army. My God, think of it. It's irregular, it's like a territorial army, beating up on the People's Liberation Army and making them run away. Extraordinary people. Our captain went there, uh, an assault ship uh, docked in um, Cameron Bay or in northern Vietnam. Um, I'm forgetting the point. So an assault ship, the Indian Navy ship, just, just a few years back. And the captain was taking in ceremony to Garland a statue. He didn't know what was happening. The captain told me, the Indian Navy captain, who was a friend of mine, said to me, I was taken in great ceremony, you know, with band playing, and, and I was supposed to, I was climbed up the uh, ladder and garlanded this Vietnamese hero. So the Indian Rear Admiral asked, the flotilla commander asked the, his counterpart, the Vietnamese, who is this great hero I am garlanding? He says, he was the great hero who beat back the second to last Chinese invasion of Vietnam in the 13th century. If you talk to the Vietnamese, they talk about a thousand year war with China. Thousand year war. And we can't focus on 20 years. You know, that's why it's so dispiriting. And you feel frustrated. Small country showing so much, so much pith, and so much vigor, and so much fighting spirit. And here we are influenced by any passing country that gives you a green card, that gives your, uh, you know, son or daughter some quote scholarship or something. Essentially, you know what a Pakistani told me who are worse, by the way, in this respect, than we are. He said to me, Mr. Karnad, they 
हम हम सब लोग बिकाऊ हैं ये स्पोकन असेंशियल ट्रूथ बट बिकॉज यू आर नॉट फीलिंग टू रिकनाइज ऑफ बी सेल्फ क्रिटिकल और रिकनाइज द ट्रूथ वी नेवर एक्नोलेज इट वेन यू डोंट एक्नोलेज योर ओन फीलिंग्स यू नेवर इम्प्रूव बिकॉज यू थिंक यू ऑलरेडी मेड इट When people say we are trillion dollar economy, trillion dollar, hey, what trillion dollar economy? You, you know, it's on. People don't understand. Trillion dollar economy is on a concept called purchasing power parity. It's not actual. It's like paper money. You say, "Be." It's all theoretical and abstract. For this amount of money, what can I buy in American terms? Naturally, you'll, you'll be a trillion dollar economy. because the cook i employ in my kitchen for whatever amount of rupees is a fraction of what i would have to pay a cook in america but then that is equated by kitna lagta so therefore you are a trillion dollar economy and we believe it we believe these kinds of advertisements about ourselves one thing media people will tell you i mean you know advertising people will tell you you don't believe your own message in <laughs> it's a hoax it's a, something to sell a soap a cinema or salman khan or something like that it ought to be taken seriously but we take our own advertisement seriously about ourselves 